<laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Diane Kaplan. I'm president of Rasmussen Foundation. Today we've had a historic gathering of governors and lieutenant governors of the state of Alaska. What they share in common is their love of our great state, their history of public service and commitment to our state, and a desire to see a good future for our children and grandchildren. We've asked them to come together to share their advice and expertise, the history they share in helping us address the state's very urgent fiscal situation. Now I'd like to turn it over to Governor Knowles. Thank you, and this, uh, as, as was mentioned, historical meeting of former elected officials, certainly bipartisan, uh, to get together to deal with one of the most pressing issues of our day is really thanks to the Rasmussen Foundation, uh, Diane Kaplan, we thank you, and for the project of uh, Plan for Alaska, where they have focused on the budget deficit, which has reached a historical high, as was announced this morning, of a yearly amount of $4.1 billion a year. What's interesting about the meeting that just took place with uh, strong feelings, a lot of history, but one common intense desire to do what's right for Alaska. And we were able in a couple of hours to come up with agreement on six basic points that we feel if the legislature does in this session will make a significant contribution to the resolution of this problem. Uh, you have on, oh, I guess it's not up, up there. You have the, uh, the six points uh, covered quickly, and then each person here, I'm sure, will want to address it. Uh, one that clearly the current state deficit is the most significant in our state's history. We also know that we, and all agree, that we don't have enough revenue to pay for the government we currently have. We have to do some significant changing in how we do business. We need a combination of cuts and new revenues. But we also discussed how the permanent fund was created to help pay for essential state services when oil declined, and that day has come. Everybody benefits from state services, and everybody should pay for them. It's important for people to help pay for government so they're connected to how the government's funds are spent. We also recognize that we can protect the permanent fund dividend for the long term if we commit to use a share of the permanent fund earnings to make a significant reduction in the deficit. Making decisions this year, this year to adopt a sustainable, balanced budget is essential because we know the longer that we wait, the fewer options that we have. Doing nothing is our worst enemy. It's not the fact that people may disagree, but doing nothing is our worst enemy. And the consequences, I think everybody agrees, are devastating for the Alaska that we know and love. So with that, uh, Governor Sheffield, Governor Murkowski, any comments that you want to make? Well, I think we all know that we need to act now. We need to do whatever we're going to do to cut the budget and balance the budget this year. If we don't do it this year, 18 months, two years from now, we'll be in real trouble. And I'm really concerned about it. But I think the only way we're going to solve the problem is, is for the governor and the legislature to act this year, cut the budget, balance it, and use some other revenues to pay for our budget, but we, we're, we, um, our budget's too big, too big for the state. We live too long on oil. We need to cut back. Governor Murkowski. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> you know, the devil's in the details, and we're not too heavy on the details. It reminds me a little bit of uh, our presidential <clears throat> candidate Trump who generalizes, but nevertheless, the intentions, I think, of this group are worthy of Alaskan attention. You know, my feeling is government's too big and we can't afford it. Uh, 
But the points uh, that have been elaborated here, uh, such as, you know, this is a rainy day fund that was created by the wisdom of Alaskans and the legislature, and as has been pointed out, that time is here, and it's important that we use it for the purpose it was designed for, and uh, uh, prompt decisions uh, are appropriate and paramount because the longer you wait, the more you still have the decision to make. But I suggest that we evaluate very carefully these decisions first, particularly in the area of revenue increases, because as you increase revenue, that revenue has to come from somebody or something, and that could be detrimental to uh, their continued reinvestment in Alaska. So we have to balance that because we have to have incentives to continue our funding from our resources oil, gas, timber, fish, minerals, and tourism. That's the future of Alaska. And prosperity is only generated from those sources because we're not big enough to live on each other uh, like some of the other states. So I think this is a worthwhile effort, and I think it's meaningful to remind the public of the significance and importance of it. I would just have made one more suggestion that the four, three or four bills pending uh, be evaluated uh, by independent consultants such as those that are on on the uh, retainer from the permanent fund because you might get uh, some views that we have not uh, uh, considered relative to uh, some of the nuances in these three bills. But uh, that's, that's fun to do it themselves. But in any event, I think, I think it's been a meaningful effort and I commend the Rasmussen Foundation and it's uh, been worthwhile joining with uh, the governors and lieutenant governors, because we do care. I'll just jump in and say that I think what we all share is a sense of urgency, that there is still time in this legislative session to make some of the hard decisions that are absolutely essential if the state of Alaska's future is going to be as bright as its past. The size of the budget deficit is simply too big to get there alone with budget cuts, $4 billion. You could get rid of all of our state agencies and only pay for education, and you still wouldn't have enough to fill the gap. So that is why we are all talking about the importance of using permanent fund earnings to fill the gap, not just this year, but for the long term, as part of a strategy to make sure that our fiscal picture is healthy. That's important for our private sector. That's important for the bond market. That's important for everybody who wants to call Alaska home long into the future. We also believe that that's the only way that you can actually save the permanent fund dividend. Because if you just do kind of a stopgap measure right now, you end up burning through your reserves in just a few years. And then there won't be a permanent fund dividend. So for those of us who were part of the process for many years of making sure that the permanent fund was adopted in 1976 and the dividend was adopted in 1981. If you're thinking long term, we encourage the legislature this year to put in place a fiscal regime that has sustainability. We're all counting on you and, and supporting you and we hope that the people of the state will give support to our legislators who are willing to make tough decisions that will really benefit us all for the long term. Uh, I think if we, we look back uh, from the time of the creation of the permanent fund, it was a rainy day fund. The dividend was actually an afterthought. Uh, the permanent fund was created with the understanding that oil is a finite resource, that it's going to run out someday, uh, and that order, in order to meet the needs of Alaskans, we were going to have to rely on that fund. Uh, the genius of the dividend is it gave the citizens uh, a hand in their government. Uh, it's a, a greed-based motivator. People want that dividend, and they, therefore they pay attention to it. Uh, we are the lowest taxed state in the United States. And because people don't look closely uh, at that aspect of government, uh, the services have got out of hand. Our government uh, is larger per capita than any government in the United States, and we play the least amount uh, to support uh, that level of services. We've all come to agreement that uh, we cannot afford the level of government that we have right now. 
So it's a combination of cutting the budget, it's a combination of taking a portion of the permanent fund earnings, and it's a combination of increasing taxes. I know that there are some in, in the legislature uh, that argue that we should not adopt taxes, uh, and they want to take it all from the dividend. There are others who want to take uh, it all from taxes and maintain the dividend. We have met and all of us agree that it has to be a combination of those three things. And I think that anyone, as uh, Lieutenant Governor Ulmer mentioned, who has a, uh, a long-term desire to remain in Alaska, see children grow up in Alaska and their grandchildren grow up in Alaska, uh, would take a look at that in the last recessions that we have gone through and seek to avoid that ever happening again. I might uh, add that any time you get a group like this together, you can expect that there will be uh, political differences, uh, and there were in our discussions, and uh, you know, different people would emphasize different things. Uh, but the fact that we come down to a, a basic statement is progress, really, in, in the what, about two hours that we had. Uh, I, for one, would like to see more structural and transformational changes in government, just how we deliver services. And I mentioned in the group, including in how we deliver educational services and how we provide for welfare. Uh, those are our two biggest cost drivers, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, those are some, some things. I, I was pleased to see this, uh, the Senate yesterday unanimously pass some changes in Medicaid. And I go, progress. And we're going to need to be looking at uh, more and more things like that to be able to, uh, to bring government within, uh, with, within an affordable uh, budget. And uh, what that is, we haven't got to that point yet today, but, uh, but at least to make statements, uh, this much of a statement, I, I would say it's progress. I uh, joined this group because I believe that we have to work our way through this situation, we have to do it this year. And if we uh, keep kicking the can down the road on the use of permanent fund income, I don't think we're going to be able to address any of the other issues that we have to address in the state. And the issue of whether or not to use the permanent fund, a lot of people don't want to touch it. They're afraid that if you touch it, it's going to take away the dividend. And uh, the language in here, we all agreed that the best way to defend the dividend over the long period of time is to make sure that we've got the savings account and not burn our seed corn. And Governor Knowles, thanks for that contribution on the seed corn. You came from a farming background, I guess. But the, the, the point being this, is that to balance the budget this year, you're either going to have to use the constitutional budget reserve or permanent fund income. And if you use the budget reserves, you're you're taking away from money that could be used to develop more income in the future. And so uh, there are three bills pending in the legislature right now that would use permanent fund income to help resolve the deficit problem. And uh, they all have certain differences. There's one by the governor, there's one by Representative Hawker, there's one by Senator McGuire. And uh, we hope the legislature doesn't leave Juno until they've come up with one of them that works. And it will probably be a combination of all three. But that's a, that, to me, is the most important thing. I don't, I, I don't think there's a consensus here on what taxes, if any, we would want to see instituted. I don't think there's a consensus here on what cuts, though there is a consensus that we want to see cuts. But there's definitely a consensus that we need to start using the permanent fund for what it was intended to be used for. Are there any questions? Yeah. Did you guys agree to some sort of statement or, or bullet points? And if so, is, is that something maybe we can see before while asking questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, Chief. Any questions at all? Yes, sir. John, with a lot of round of your comments. I was wondering, uh, there's been a lot of talk in the legislature about, obviously, additional cuts. Um, but there also is a lot of uh, sentiment expressed that we haven't really felt, as a state, the cuts that were put in place last year. Uh, would you think that's fair to say? How do you feel about when we're going into recommending additional cuts, 
uh, we're taking into account, we haven't yet felt the full brunt of the cuts that were already in place last year. I'll just offer two comments on that. <clears throat> I used to spend time at the University of Alaska Anchorage. I was the chancellor. And I was in Fairbanks last week for a big Arctic science meeting. And I was talking with people at UAF about how many people they're going to have to lay off because of budget cuts. So I can assure you <clears throat> that the people who are being laid off in the university know that there are cuts. And similarly, as you go through different agencies, depending upon exactly who you talk to, you'll get a very different feel about how up close and personal those budget reductions are already being felt. If you talk to the private sector, you will hear as well in the private sector people being laid off, people not being hired, that they hoped they would get a job because of anticipated reductions in the capital budget. As you know, the capital budget last year was pretty small. There's still money left over from previous capital budgets, which is still sort of flowing in the pipeline. So maybe the, the feeling of that is a little delayed, but that doesn't mean that it's not happening. And I might just note, you know, if you wait for the real pain to be felt, as Lieutenant Governor Meade Treadwell said, it will be too late because you will have burned up some of the very reserves that you need to help you get through a period of time that is this transition as we adjust to a different level of spending. Your question is well taken, however. Um, uh, Fran is absolutely right. The people who are directly affected by the cuts are obviously going to feel it. But uh, Diane, if you could refer, I don't know if you have it in front of you, to the polling that was done by the Rasmussen Foundation and uh, what the general public feeling is about whether uh, significant cuts have been made to the budget. Uh, we found in uh, polling Alaskans that uh, most Alaskans had very little understanding of what cuts were made in the 2015 session. In fact, they were about $500 million. They're starting to be felt different places, uh, but uh, we found that most Alaskans were not aware of them. I, I would just say to that, uh, I own a cabin down in Girdwood, and we're very concerned about our troopers down there, and that's one of the cuts. Uh, I see it in our libraries. I see it in the uh, issue on the on the uh, Anchorage ballot on the Alaska on the Anchorage ballot uh, coming up in April. And uh, you know the the point is these are good debates to have, and we've got to figure out other ways to pay for what we need. But uh, the fact is is that I would not give up working on cuts. There's still efficiencies to be gained in government, uh, and. Uh, there is a connection between people and their permanent fund dividend and the size of government, and people don't want to see the dividend go down. And most of those bills, the three bills that I talked about, try to have some sort of connection between the size of dividend and the size of government. That's, that's actually taking care of that Alaska disconnect that we've talked about for so many years. But the fact is, is we can't kick the can and not look at using permanent fund uh, revenues if we want to keep the dividend. I, uh, I'll respond to that uh, question. I work in the engineering profession, and so the, I have interaction with the construction industry and, and engineering, and that's largely driven by a capital budget, and the industries are seeing uh, impact. There's delays in projects, just reductions, uh, attrition, and so in that, in that part of our economy, of course, it's not just state government that's driving it. The, the, it's the industry itself <coughs> shrinkage with the price of oil being down that you know that's delaying projects uh, also but uh, there is an impact uh, you know when the capital budget shrinks uh, you know that's going to be felt in uh, throughout the economy there's there's a lot of discussion today about the difficulties we have the problems with the deficit the economic consequences of not addressing it, people getting laid off, and what can we do to possibly get it going on the right track. But this is not what we decided upon today, a defensive posture at all. Because if we're able to transform a budget that for years have su has suffered the vagaries of a commodity, non-renewable co commodity price, that be oil, going up and down with the recession of 86, the recession of 98, and now the recession, and then uh, potential recession now, 
what we're going to do is because of our savings, the wisdom of having the permanent fund, as was mentioned, the permanent fund principal, the permanent fund earnings reserve, which is also around $7 billion, and then the constitutional budget reserve of almost $10 billion, we have the savings, the earnings of which can be the cornerstone of a future sustained balanced budget. No state in America is in that situation. Nobody has that kind of stability and opportunity for essential services being delivered without having to depend on uh, fluctuating oil prices and increasingly higher taxes and other issues. So what we're, but we emphasize, and I, I just totally agree with it, that if we don't do it now, it's gonna slip through our fingers because for every year that we wait, we are eating the seed corn because those are the earnings that are gonna pay for a long-term sustainable budget. This is Frank Murkowski. I, I just like to comment on what I believe is a reality, and, and we've discussed the, re, the conditions associated with our economy and uh, why it happened. It happened because of the price of oil, but we are not producing as much oil as we used to, so uh, we can't expect relief that way. So we're going to have a recession. We're in a recession. Jobs are disappearing in the industry, the oil industry. Uh, jobs are, are going to decline in the private sector as well. But the idea that the, we can, through the legislative process, make the landing a little softer by using the permanent fund uh, and uh, the intelligent use of selecting just how much revenue to try and increase, uh, how much of the government are we going to have to reduce is, a, is a, obviously a, a responsibility of the legislature and hopefully our input of supporting an orderly process so that we can come out of this. Now what we're not doing here, and it's important and should be a second step, is how we can grow the economy how we can take our basic resources and enhance the growth through investment and through competition uh, because it's a world market that Alaska serves and you're not going to get out of it unless you develop these alternative resources. And the sooner the better and we still got to maintain enough incentive so that Alaska can be competitive in oil, gas, minerals, what have you. So it's a balancing act, and the permanent fund plays a paramount role in it because it's all we can look towards in this void that we've got. But make no mistake about it, I was in the banking industry during the time that the pipeline terminated and the jobs went begging, and what happens if people left the state, a lot of them did, because without a good job, you can't afford to live here. And as a consequence, we went through this process, but it hurt because mortgage rates, obviously the mortgage market was tough and uh, uh, we, we were overbuilt and uh, this, we didn't have a permanent fund. This time we have this safety net, so to speak, and the question is how to properly use it in the interest of all Alaskans. So I commend the group and uh, we'll see how it goes from here. Yes, um, so I noticed in the in the six point um, sheet that was passed out, spending cuts are mentioned. The permanent mm -hmm. funds mentioned. The word taxes are not used. Is there a consensus amongst the seven of you that new broad based taxes are needed and needed this year? No. No. <clears throat> taxes have a different definition with different people. If you're talking about state income tax, I think it's fair to say that there's not a lot of support from our group. Uh, uh, you've got a situation on the North Slope uh, where you know, revenue streams uh, uh, and the tax incentives have reached a point where uh, uh, you know, they're about a balance and I think the legislature is probably going to cut some of those incentives uh, as a consequence of necessity. But, uh, 
this is a this is a if you if you set out a tax across the board tax, what you're doing is making Alaska and Alaskans less competitive in the sense that we need to ensure that we have an investment climate that encourages capital to come in because they come in, as I've said, for the highest return and the least risk, and they can go anywhere in the world. And they're only here because they think they can make a fair return on investment. So we have to have a tax policy that's fair and equitable, fair to, to, to our government, and fair to our citizens. And uh, we've got a tax program now that has been evaluated uh, over a period of time, and I think uh, uh, I think industry recognizes that it's on the high end, but they're willing to pay it. But right now, industry is willing not making a return on its investment simply because the price is so low. So there's no magic answer to it. To clarify the answer to your question, there wasn't consensus on whether or not taxes should be adopted this year. It's not the case that there was consensus that they not be adopted this year. So that's a, there was no consensus on the question of whether or not other taxes should be adopted this year. Some of us felt there should be, some of us felt not yet. So that was addressed in item four, which is basically we see value in a broad-based taxation system that connects people to the government that they get. Because as you know, since we did away with our personal income tax in 1980, there has been no general state tax, no income tax, no sales tax. And I would argue, and I won't speak on behalf of the group at this moment, that when people think that government services are free, there's almost no end to the desire for more of them. So unless we do institute something like either an income tax or a sales tax, we are not really conveying to the public the right message that, oh, by the way, guess what? It costs money to plow the roads, to maintain a state ferry, to educate our children, to hire troopers, to keep people in prison. And yes, we've been lucky. Prudhoe Bay has paid for that. but. Sometime in the very near future, we need a broad-based tax. What we were not able to agree on was what that should look like or exactly when it should be implemented. So that remains something that we all have our own personal opinions on. Unless you think that everyone's on one side of the fence and not the other, uh, I personally would promote an income tax. Uh, I wouldn't mind paying a sales tax uh, and having the amount that's uh, collected by the state rebated to any city that would adopt a tax to that level. So let's say you had a state sales tax of 6%. If a city adopted a sales tax of 6%, that could be rebated back to the city, and then we wouldn't have to worry about municipal uh, revenue sharing. Uh, cities could take care of uh, funding their schools to a, to a larger degree. In those areas of the state where no taxes are collected at the state level, uh, the taxes would either be collected by the state or re rebated to the municipality. For those who wonder if uh, that's ever been done in the state, it has. Odd valorem property taxes collected from the pipeline are rebated up to 20 mills uh, to the North Slope Borough, the City and Borough of Fairbanks, and uh, uh, the City of Valdez, and right here in the municipality of Anchorage. Uh, any, any taxes on pipeline property, Alieska property, uh, is taxed by the state and then rebated to those municipalities up to the 20 mill level. Although there was not a specific mention of the word taxes in here that is clearly referred to in a number of the statements, the severity of the deficit of $4 billion is actually somewhat of a relief to people who need to argue the, any particular favorite <laughs> source of new revenue, because we're going to need it all. We're going to need taxes. We're going to need cuts. We're going to need permanent fund earnings reserves. We're going to need reserves from the other savings accounts. So we're going to need, but, the, but we, we met for two hours. And we were able to figure out this broad scope of what needs to be done with an emphasis on urgency and the fact that it, it uh, has to have a sustainable, balanced budget. So that's going to be part of the discussion that as the legislature looks to what may be 25 to 30 percent of the deficit, 
between balances, uh, balances of cuts and, uh, and revenues, that if you have that cornerstone in place, it's all doable. And that's what we're saying that the legislature has to act upon. So what is what's, consensus what's important about what the governor knows has said is that, is that we need to do it now. We need to act now. If we wait and put this off until the next year, we'll be in serious trouble. And, and uh, we, we, we've got to cut the budget. And we, we've got to, the, the legislature and the governor are going to have to work this thing out so that um, there's accomplishments this year on our problem. What, what is the consensus for those accomplishments amongst your group? Cutting spending and use of the permanent fund earnings reserve, but not taxes until at some point in the future? Well, just a minute, I, I would remind my colleagues here for just a minute that, you know, this isn't a tax-free society in Alaska. We have high sales tax, traditionally the sales tax has gone to the communities. If you want to put a state tax on top of that, you can do that. And I think a rebate is the way we have to be working. We've already discussed it. We have high real estate taxes, high in relationship to what? Well, in the eyes of the beholder. So we're not a tax-free society by any means. People who live here, people who have real estate, people who have commercial property, they pay taxes. Now, the, the, the idea here is whether or not you address this cancer by trying to reduce spending or generate more revenue or grow the economy. Those are the only alternatives we have. And you can't go into growing the economy in a couple of hours what we did was responsibly look at can state government be reduced in size and cost. It's too expensive. It's too big. That's my opinion. And, uh, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people in Alaska that agree with that concept. On the other hand, when you look at the general, okay, let's tax, make up the difference in taxes, that's impractical because you can't make up the difference in taxes. You've got to have another source, otherwise you just kill uh, the, the, the structure. And that is responsibly using a portion of the earnings of the permanent fund. And the intent of our group was to, to not have it necessarily address the dividend risk, maintain the dividend up to a level that's reasonable whether it's about or whatever. So what we tried to do was reach a balance. So when you when you start going into, well, why don't you tax this, that, or the other thing, no, we'd be here for it. Casey, you know, I, I think the one thing, if, if you realize what a change in our bond rating is, is it makes it more expensive for us to bring investment in the state for infrastructure. All right? So one of the reasons why our bond rating is changing is because people don't think in the ratings agencies that Alaska is going to have its act together fiscally. All right? So to help the investment climate, let's try to figure out how to do this. And doing this with the permanent fund earnings is one way to get there. That's number one. Number two, my, my job and, you know, whether I've been in the public sector or the private sector, I've always been somebody who's arguing that we need to bring more investment into Alaska. All right, and to do that, you need stability. Well, right now we have something that is so unstable that people are questioning our ability to, get, to, to, to make things work. And if the legislature goes home without addressing this issue, at least on the most obvious solution, the one that you can get four, Republican, or four Democrats and three Republicans in this room to agree on, we're gonna have a big problem. And we're gonna have fewer options later. Now, you know, my, my friend Steve next to me he likes to likes taxes. I don't. I think I think the kinds of taxes that he talks about is make it harder for me to bring investment into the state. So we're not a, we don't have a consensus there, but we do have a consensus that if we use some of the permanent fund earnings now, we're going to have fewer problems later. And Alaska is going to have a much more solid foundation on which to invest because if you want jobs back, Jobs come with investment. Jobs come with people forming capital, starting businesses, drilling more holes, putting pipelines in, putting ports in with the Arctic growth. There's tremendous opportunities here. But if you have an unstable place to invest, you're not going to get it. 
So, what is your opinion? Can we make this the last question? Yeah, everybody has to. Well, and let me just add to that that it's, uh, I don't like taxes, uh, but I have a sense of responsibility to my state and my fellow citizens. I'm willing to pay taxes. Taxes are what we pay for living in a free society. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. It was really good for all of us to get together. Could I get everybody to sign this? I would love it for sort of my... Yeah, just... Why don't we sign each other? I think we ought to sign each other's. Thanks, everybody, for coming.